but I'd like you to come over. We will start from Michael on the left side. Um, generally speaking, no, one second. That's what you like to introduce. But instead of asking everybody different questions, I'd like you to think about when you became an um, apprentice of Toshiko Takaezu, what you enjoyed, what did you learn from her, and how long you've been working on your ceramic pieces. That kind of general questions that I don't have to ask each of you. Okay? Okay, Leslie? Yes. Leslie was a curator installation curator, and then Jeff uh, Boras is the coordinator of this show, along with some others. So we thank you very, very much for bringing wonderful show. Everybody enjoyed those who came. Those who didn't come, they missed a great show. Okay, Leslie, thank you. Hello, everyone. Hello. Um, I see some different faces from the opening. So I'm, most people know how we got to know each other and the sequence of things, but for those of you that don't know, I'm going to just give a little bit of information. Um, most of Toshiko's apprentices were students of hers at Princeton or students of mine at Skidmore, um, and then some other people. I think she found along the way, but for the most part they were people that uh, she had gotten to know before through their educational experiences and they weren't necessarily all art majors. Um, and then as she, I like to say, vetted them <laughs> through her visits um, from my experience to Skidmore, they started, they began the apprenticeship with her and I'm really curious to learn what each one of you took from that experience. I know there's lots of things that you learned and carry with you, but if in your discussion about you and your work could also just zero in on one or two things about Toshiko and things about yourself that you and your work that you carry with you today. And maybe that will reflect in how we view the work. I know a lot of things popped into my mind as I was installing the show. So, with that, I guess we'll go to Mike. Hello, everybody. Um, I was a student of Toshiko's at Princeton University. <coughs> I took, um, I'm going to put this down, I'm just going to talk. I think everyone can hear me. Is that okay with everyone? So, I took the class every year for the four years I was there, uh, fall and spring, so I had eight uh, classes with her. And during that time, got to know her, um, did the Raku at, at her place in Quakertown. She had just moved to Quakertown at that time. Um, during that time, um, met Bill Bombach. He was her apprentice at that, there. Uh, Paul Duncan was there at that time. Um, I heard about Don, but never really met Don. Um, and it was just great. It was my uh, release at school to be able to go and work in the ceramic studio. So I just really got immersed in it. Uh, it, was, it was really freeing. And then as I get time to graduate, I decided, no, I didn't want to go to med school. I wanted to do art. Um, and Toshiko was more than happy to say, come back. I'll let you teach the faculty wives. We'll start getting you ready, get a portfolio together, and start. you can start thinking about where you want to go for your MFA. I did a summer six. I went up to Skidmore, did their summer program, met Regis Brody, met Leslie, um, and I was ready to take that big jump, um, and then life intervened, and I ended up in a rock and roll band. Um, I left her, she goes scratching her head. Um, she was very supportive, and I said, I'm gonna try to do both for a little while, if you don't mind, 
I lived on a farm near Quaker Town. Uh, it was filled, we rented the farm, we had chicken coops. Uh, she gave me a wood stove and a, and a kick wheel, and I converted one of the chicken coops into a studio, and I was very happy. Um, and she was very supportive. She came, Bill brought her to see us one night. She came down and saw me, and then uh, rock and roll lifestyle schedule doesn't really coincide with hard working at, at her studio. I was always late. I would be in my, uh, chastised for being late a lot, uh, you know, because I, you know, wake up and go, oh, I got to be there. Um, so, and that's where I learned responsibility, but I also learned my work ethic. I was, so she could talk, there's no difference if you put yourself into what you're doing, there's no difference between working in the garden, working on your music, working in clay, it's all the same as long as you bring yourself to it. And that stayed with me all my life. It's the major thing that I learned from her. Other good things I learned from her, how to cook for a large group of people, I learned that. Um, one of my favorite things was having lunch um, at Toshiko's. And the other thing which I value was, she was always willing to lend an ear and talk while we're working in the garden, if I was working through issues or anything like that. She would always lend a very supportive ear and just listen and talk to, to me and stuff like that. So. Um, you know, from knowing Toshiko, I learned I have no common sense whatsoever. Ever, I was always to told to use my cabeza all the time, um, and that stuck. And you know, so when I think of her, it's someone who's always supportive. It's just kind of this unquestioning support that I received from her, um, and it made me very happy. I stepped away from ceramics uh, at one point because I couldn't give it what I knew it demanded from me. Um, it's, it's just time consuming and it's also demanding and I didn't have that to put in and I knew I would diminish my work if I didn't put that type of time into it. So I stepped away. Um, a big regret of mine is I didn't start back up until after she passed and that's something I you know, deeply regret. Uh, it was Bill who gave me a bag of clay at her memorial service and I started back up and I haven't stopped. So when I think about my pieces, and especially the large ones, yes, they're influenced by her closed forms, shape-wise a little bit. I use the same glazes that I've always used from Princeton in her studio. And that's, it's kind of subliminal, I think, the way the glazes interact, and you just kind of learn what works and what doesn't. Um, so it's those things. And like I said, it's, it's more her support and just, you know, the giving nature of her to support people and artists. Um, and that's what I'm thankful for. Any questions about my work? Beautiful. All right. Beautiful. Thank you. Why are you always making the pot or something else? I, early I would do more sculptural pieces, um, interlocking pieces that would sit out in the garden, uh, garden rocks that had depressions in them. I still do those sometimes. But mainly I've been doing uh, pot, you know, large urn for forms. I stopped throwing. There's too many people associated with Toshiko Studio that throw much better than I ever could. And it was kind of um, just, I retreated from, from that. Uh, because it's, when you see it day in and day out, you go, it's never going to be as good as that, and I'm constantly trying to find ways of making it different. Let me stick with hand building, because that's, I'm coming through much better, and that's only what she always told us, is find your voice and let yourself come through. So that's why I stepped away from, from throwing. Mike, I also want to know, um, can you create patterns on your pieces? Is that something that you learned as a student or something that came to you after that? I, st I started doing it at Princeton. I was told, cool it by Toshika. <laughs> um, and I still try to get around that, that edict of honor. I started doing uh, Raku pieces that were smaller. They were hand built, but then I put slabs of printed stuff on the outside of them, and I was doing that for a while. Um, and once I started up again, it just kind of came out big time, and it's um, 
it's more an influence of an artist, and I don't forget his name, I forget his name. She took us to the New York, uh, New York Museum, and he demonstrated it, and it was a Japanese artist, and he was using woodcuts and <coughs> stuff like that, and that just sunk in and go. So um, the big eye opener I had from this showing is, kids love to touch my work, and that was a, that was a thank you Tim, that was a total eye opener for me as far as the tactile nature of it. All right, next. Okay, I'm Fitzhu Carroll, and I was apprentice um, 2004, 2005, I guess. And one of the open houses we had that year, for some reason I particularly remember Leslie, or I associate with her with this, we had a flood, and there was water, sort of a foot of water in the studio, and so we made gangplanks to walk around the open house, and it was still a success, and it was kind of like, it's just, it's a fun memory I have. But as a result of this flood issue, we realized that we had to, Toshika realized we had to sort of dig a new trench out the courtyard and make a new drain. And so we did that. We hired some local guy, Eugene Doby, I remember his Doby name actually. Sons. Doby and Sons. Yep. And uh, anyway, after the whole drain thing was put in and the gravel was sort of a mess in the courtyard, she said, well, we've got to get more gravel. So we coordinate, you know, delivery of gravel. So Doby and Sons brought a big dump truck of gravel. They, dumped it out and graded it and then a couple days later she said you know I think 10% of the stones in the mix are like a little too big so <laughs> you should you know you should go around just when you get an idle hour here and there every other day you know just spend an hour and take the big stones out and throw them in the woods or actually probably don't throw them in the woods probably keep them somewhere else so that they could be used at some other time um, so that story kind of in some ways sums up um, I mean, that touches on her kind of work ethic and, you know, attention to detail, but this sort of, I was so frustrated, I was like, why am I, I don't want to go through and pick out little stones, like were big stones or whatever it was, and this is so pointless, and it probably took a month until she finally was like, okay, I think, you know, we've thinned it out enough, and, you know, this looks good, but by the end of the month, I was kind of like, oh, this, that was a really neat, long-term, very, very small, step-at-a-time project that I thought was going to be horrible, horrible, but it ended up being this kind of, ended up being a, sort of an interesting lesson. Um, and that is sort of a metaphor for often what I think about, uh, you know, from that, that period and what I took away from it. Um, but I'm sure, Mike, yeah, I mean, every one of us will probably say a similar version of kind of what you said, which is, you know, I thought in some ways you think you work hard before and, you know, going through that year of realizing the dedication to all the different facets, not just the studio work, and, you know, in her case, everything really was connected and it was all sort of the same pursuit and I, you know, I try to bring that enthusiasm in the kitchen and think that it kind of overlaps with studio work in that same way too, but um, so yeah, I think her, namely, really just work ethic, enthusiasm, um, she opened my eyes to, um, I don't know, a, a lot of things, it was sort of a spiritual experience that year and, and a lot of that feeling and drive I think, um, that she had dropped off on me and I really uh, enjoy that now. And my work has kind of diverged from, from clay a little bit, or a lot of it. Um, I do some ceramic stuff still here and there, but um, she encouraged me to go on to grad school and I did that and that was, I was working in clay and clay turned into wood because I wanted things to sort of reach further distances physically and, um, and then so I've sort of been working in wood and now metal and um, mixed media stuff, but whenever I get back to play, I guess the last time was that show, Providence show, which was pretty fun. Um, but I, yeah, the shapes and things and the, and the processes and uh, things that, I guess, interests that were solidified during that year uh, with her are still very much with me. Um, and despite sort of working in other media, I still very much feel connected to uh, the groundwork that, sort of, that was laid there. Yeah. Any questions? Okay. So, I'm sorry. Um, my question take for instance, that wood piece. Mm -hmm. um, have you thought about making with the clay, see how it will sustain the mm -hmm. shape? Have you? Have you I, done that? I have it with this. I have made. I do think about, um, I work sort of this scale probably the most commonly. This sort of scale, I'll, I mean, I'll be making something, maybe I don't like it, I cut it in half or, you know, many parts, and then I have all these sort of little disparate elements laying around. This one, you know, I haven't thought about things on this scale being translated back into clay, but 
you know, just that question and also, you know, seeing all the work from all you guys is making me think a little bit about some play ideas too. Um, you know, or if, let's, you know, if just that piece was clay and then it was affixed to wood or, or something like that, you know, that could be, yeah, that could be interesting. Um, yeah, some, usually my smaller kind of stuff is experimental, almost found object. You know, I don't necessarily set out to make that combination. It's just I'll have a sea of stuff all over the floor in the studio or in the desk and kind of piece things together. Whereas these kind of things are more sketches on a piece of wood or small sketches, which I'll translate up to a bigger size. But um, yeah, maybe I'll, maybe I'll, you know, standard supply, get some, get some play set down, maybe we'll try a few things. <laughs> Uh, these are uh, these are just pine. Um, yep, yeah, white pine boards. Um, yep, joined up, and then I sort of with this really long, uh, you know, long curve will sort of you know trace out lines, and then I use a power planer to sort of fare down the edges. Um, and I, yeah, these ones started as just sort of just planar objects like this, and then I started linking them together so that I could make them stand up um, three-dimensionally, and then these were sort of the beginning of a, uh, models for a series of public artworks that I have, which are actually in steel, um, because they were that much bigger than this, and sort of needed more longevity, but um, yeah, pine, I'm, I'm not pretty, I mean, occasionally I have really nice, I do have some nice wood, and I'll make really high finish versions of something, you know, in these, in, in these veins, in, you know, walnut or exotic yeah, woods that I have. Wood, yeah, I'll just leave it wood, yeah. Um, and now I'm kind of mixing some of the some thicker wood, raw wood materials with uh, carp, like finely carved kind of stuff like this, with metal, which I'm finding to be make the metal more interesting. This was just three quarters, but I've done them up to like inch and a half. Um, I'll get you know eight quarter or six quarter lumber and join those up, and those are actually. Those are actually even more satisfying, really, because, I mean, yes, they're a lot more heavy, but you can really get a much more complex curve, you know, out at the end there. And, uh, this one worked, and then I oriented it in such in my studio where there was moisture on the other side, and it worked back, and then now it's been great. Yeah. So, uh, quick question. These pieces, uh, is a show that they call the Ocean Bureau? Oh, yeah. I, I, yeah, I know Joel's very sure. So Joel is really, and I've been influenced recently, uh, talks about the form and conceptual element of the piece uh, being defined as much by the patina as by the form. Mm -hmm. So here, and these pieces are a big piece of Bob Cooper's wood with a purple patina. Mm. So, how, you know, are you. Uh, in terms of your conceptual ideas. Uh, yeah, I mean, surfaces are, to me, actually, um, maybe since kind of getting out of being focused on clay, where I really did like making, you know, going in the boys' kitchen, just, you know, making funky concoctions that were probably not replicable, um, you know, where I really was focused on surface, I'm less focused on surface now and more I'll make something purely based on a formal idea or a formal desire. And then, I'm, then I'll sort of be just shopping for, for a you know, for a finish based on materials that I have, or I'll see something somewhere. It usually, patina surfaces don't really guide it; it's more formal. Um, for a larger kind of larger freestanding sculpture, I'll often even just work in black paper or black cardstock, and I make models like that. And that's how I get um, recently how I've been generating concepts. So colors kind of come after. Uh, one of the big pieces I have in a park right now wasn't even going to have going to have any color, and then I sort of decided day of what color it was going to be, and that sort of you know I one of the pieces was up in one color, and after a few weeks I was like oh, I'm gonna change the color. Um, so it's I think that's um, I, I guess I don't really think about it that way. However, you know rusty steel and really you know a good textured you know piece of walnut that's kind of ground up a certain way or. Um, you know, I, I respond to textures, but they don't really lead to the same way. I didn't touch your pieces, but I'd like to see what how the other side looks, and then if you can make upside down, uh -huh. see how it looks. The, uh, any of them? One on the left. On the left? Okay. May I see on the bottom? Yeah, yeah, this one has another texture on the back, which you may have seen. Also, it has different coatings. This had a, I think I have a wire brush, like a power wire brush. This one has that texture. 
Oh, and upside down? I've also mounted these on the wall as sort of objects too, like that, which is sort of fun. But... Well, this one might not stand, actually. But... Yeah, I had a group of seven or eight of these, and I oriented them in another show in sort of lots of different combinations, and they're definitely not static or nor meant to be in this position always, so. Oh, this is uh, pine. Yep, it's solid pine lumber. These, this one, actually, these are an inch thick, and that one's three quarters thick. Yeah. Hey, everybody. Uh, uh, thank you, Hugo, for having uh, having us. And this closing reception is great. And I say thank you. And uh, and Hugh, of course, thank you because I, I actually. Uh, I was thinking of your rock story, oh, yeah. uh, and every apprentice has a uh, sort of hands the baton off to the next apprentice. And we, so he was the year before me, and we had uh, so the, the apprenticeship was, was usually about uh, uh, thirteen months or fourteen months, yeah, uh, thirteen months. And um, so I had uh, the first month that I arrived. Uh, he was there, and he was finishing his, his last month. And uh, so, our first, one of our first projects <coughs> was um, was putting rocks into buckets after uh, after lunch. I think that was our that was our afternoon uh, <coughs> afternoon of fun. And uh, yeah, we would move the rocks from the from the back courtyard, and we would take them in uh, in buckets up to the front. There was a front uh, little spot where there was a, a, a little parking spot in the front by the trash cans. And those, that's where the big rocks went. Um, <laughs> and along the way, of course, if we saw that there were weeds, we would definitely have to pick those as well. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, uh, so Toshiko was a really uh, huge influence in my life, and uh, was in all of our lives, and uh, aesthetically, but also, uh, in a human to human way, um, you know her her work. When I first saw it, I was at a Skidmore College studying with Leslie and Regis, and, um, and I was actually not. Uh, I had not taken any class, any ceramics before. And when I first arrived in the ceramic studio, I think there was a show of Toshiko's work at the Tang Art Museum, at Tang Teaching Art Museum, and. Um, I remember going into a room with her, her larger works, and I just I had never seen anything like them. And um, I didn't know if they were clay or what clay was or anything about ceramics, but but they were so striking to me and so um, uh, poetic and, and uh, moving to this. You know, I was just a punk uh, college kid. You know, I I didn't care about any of that stuff. But uh, it, it really made an impression on me, and and actually I took a ceramics class, and I met well I saw Toshiko in the studio, and I was really um, I was impressed by her presence, and uh, and she was making some work. I didn't really know what was going on. She had just come up for a week to throw a big large piece, and the piece was she threw it, and then it was in the kiln room drying for like three months. And I was, I just remember going, walking up to this thing, like when no one was around, no one was, you know, could see me, and I would, I would sort of lift up the plastic and look at it and just admire it. I didn't know what, what it could possibly be, what it was used for, and, and I, but I was so allured. Um, so that's just a, a thought that popped into my, in my head about that. But um, the other thing that Toshiko taught me was, uh, as, like Mike said, was to, to find my voice and to find like, what, what made me, what I wanted to do with my art and what I wanted to do as a person in the, in the world. And um, she was always like talking about you know, these sort of vague, large concepts like finding yourself or finding your voice or, um, again, this is like, just, hard for me to wrap my head around at the time, um, and 
I tried and I tried, but um, I think after years later, after having a lot of different experiences um, and going to grad school and really diving back really hard back into ceramics, I started to figure out what she meant. And I think um, she, she meant, at least for me, to like figure out what, what I wanted to, to talk about with clay and um, what my interests were and try to express them through, through my work in clay. So um, I was, I've always been interested in science and um, the natural world. And so um, I think just you know, that, that connecting back to those ideas um, and connecting back to my passions for, um, for those things that I like thinking about and reading about and talking about uh, was, was just a real huge uh, moment, a long moment uh, for, for me in, my, in the development of my work. Um, and so this work here is like very new, um, and this work is a couple years old, um, and um, I think they're both connected. Um, sort of work that's about uh, various patterns and uh, geometries and forms that are found in nature, found in architecture, uh, in technology, and uh, uh, sort of. Um, the between the handmade and the human made and the uh, naturally made um, geometry. So I'm I'm kind of uh, moved by uh, like you know heating registers and uh, patterns on in the city and um, on sewer grates and things like that. And um, so so these I would say are sort of uh, a little bit reference those those set, sorts of. Uh, um, forms and surfaces and uh, textures, um, but they're also a little bit strange in my work life too. Uh, that one um, on the floor is a little bit more about uh, thinking about the concepts of, of like um, these elemental forms um, that are found uh, at large and, and very very small scales in the in the world, in the, in the universe, um, uh, whether it's uh, you know like a nanoparticle or a, um, a, a solar system uh, or uh, something bigger. Uh, yeah. Any questions? You want to stand it up? I've never tried, but. Maybe tomorrow we can try. <laughs> 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 no, it's just for I was I was invited by a studio one uh, a friend was have an exhibition. The the end of the term she used to have uh, apprentice show, right? Now did she always uh, emphasize making the pot to begin with, or you went on on your own? Uh, that's a good question. It was usually a little bit more like, okay, Jeff, we have room in the kiln for things this tall. <laughs> so, can you make about six or twelve things that are maybe made of slabs and this tall? So, uh, and I think it was um, it was always like a. a, a like a riddle or something to really, you know, I would have to go go to bed thinking about what I was, you know, what I was doing, and, uh, not thinking too hard because it was also also really about um, in, intuition and uh, feeling through the clay, and, and uh, so she was she was never like obviously she could really see through it if if you tried to think too hard about a project, but wanted to she would tell me to let the clay speak. Um, which was difficult for me, uh, but a really, really, really awesome challenge. Um, but another thing she would do was, um, because I was, I was technically pretty good at ceramics, uh, throwing, when I arrived at Toshiko's, uh, she immediately was, was really, um, uh, was really trying to guide me in the opposite direction, trying to be more loose. Um, 
So that was something that was also difficult for me, but um, I think was a really, really great lesson. Well, in our studio, I remember there are several killings. And so many artists here, except a couple of them, they used to kill me But many other students were using those killings, I believe, besides Keshiko. Keshiko was making smaller pieces too. So when she invited students, uh, are they all recycled? That question I didn't ask her. Yeah, so the, the Tosh Toshiko um, had a lot of, um, just such a great, huge community around her. Um, she was so welcoming. And, uh, a lot of the people that she allowed to use the studio were um, people that she gravitated towards or that gravitated towards her um, throughout, um, just throughout her, her life. And, uh, you yeah, know, so some people that were in the studio were like, I don't know, people that she met at the, you know, plant sale, or um, others were people she met picking blueberries or picking mushrooms, and then others were her direct, you know, disciples. So it was a, a very um, inclusive environment. Um, and yeah, it was also really great to be around people who were making really different things and uh, coming from different places, and I would have great conversations and, you know, this one. I just had a question about the plastic in this piece, which is something I haven't seen in your work before. And, I mean, it makes me think of a number of things, but I was just wondering what you were thinking in using the plastic. Um, the plastic for this piece was um, just an idea to uh, really, well, I was, I was thinking a lot about uh, the uh, the concepts of the concept of nature, of natural, uh, what that means, uh, and also thinking at, at, at the same time about what synthetic means. We have synthetic or artificial flavors or synthetic, uh, you know, polymers and things like that. What is that, and where like where is the line between the two, um, and what you know. Um, yeah, and the same thing for nature, like where, where is nature, and is it here, or is it there, or is it, I mean, this is a city, is that nature, are we in nature, is this natural, and so is this form, um, you know, as I, as I said before, I was like sort of thinking about the hand, or the human made versus the naturally made, and um, I wanted to sort of bring in the, a really, sim a, like, over, overtly, like, synthetic, um, it's kind of giving another dimension to it. Mm -hmm. And then it also works that it's, it's kind of shiny and nice and reflects light and um, it's kind of like weird. I was, yeah. I'm also into that. Yeah. <laughs> something a little different and not just so like uh, formally type, you know, I don't know, maybe just, maybe it's another thing to shoot, to shoot the rubbed off on me. Just trying to be a little different, a little weird. <laughs> so, <laughs> there was, uh, you used the wax, didn't you? It was too thick and So, how did you, well, of course, this is a ceramics. How did you do it? After you put the glaze and then make it shiny, you waxed it. Yeah, this one, this one here is uh, uh, just has slips on the on the edge and um, has been sand they've been sanded down to reveal uh, a sort of a dimension uh, and pattern, and then uh, the the front the face of it has been sanded as well, um, like a lot sanded a lot, and it's very smooth. Um, but it still was very flat, um, so I, I applied a little bit of wax to it to give it sort of a marble, a marble look. Um, yeah, and the same, similar thing for this. Um, you know, the the edges of these other ones um, have a dimension that is separate from the flat front dimension, and um, they they kind of. Um, 
Well, I like that they, they kind of are surprising, maybe, or fun. Um, and, um, but I liked also the idea of, um, of the sanding through the layers and getting some different textures. Interesting to see the side. Yeah, it's... Uh, so much more organic. Yes. Yeah, maybe it's like this piece. I'm just, I'm still working it out. The, the natural and the, and the artificial. Okay. Next up, John Mosler. Thank you. Okay, I'm not really good at my phones, but it used to be. Uh, first of all, I, I, I do want to say that uh, it's an honor to be part of the show. Uh, and I think it really is testament to, to Chico and the individual artists, the diversity of the work and level of accomplishment of the work that uh, um, we're seeing in this show. So I want to congratulate uh, Leslie and Jeff and Yuko uh, for allowing me to be part of the show and Yuko for uh, offering us this space, um, uh, which is extraordinary. Uh, so my experience with Toshiko is uh, a little bit different. Uh, I was never an apprentice. Uh, I took her class. I was a, uh, let's say, extreme athlete in college, <laughs> and originally I was uh, taking the class because I thought it was going to be rocks for jocks, it was a term of art, <laughs> and I walked into Toshiko's class and it was immediately her presence uh, took hold and I realized that uh, uh, this was going to be a serious class or I was going to flunk. And so it wasn't about, <clears throat> um, uh, in the end, you know, for Toshiko, I don't think it was about what you were making or, you know, what level of work you were making. It was, what was your commitment? What was your level of integrity in what you were doing in the uh, class? And... Um, so I, I learned a lot about a lot about that, and then these this extraordinary gift of Toshiko's, at least in my case, where we were doing these uh, projects. I think one one of them was where we made six uh, component parts that we would put together into some form, uh, and all of a sudden, you know, I was working with coils, and something happened. Yeah, and I. I some freedom of expression happened. And I started making these things. And I didn't know where it was coming from. And it was just coming spontaneously. And uh, so this door opened up. So uh, then I went off, off on a different uh, sort of career. And a friend of mine um, suggested that I start uh, playing with Clay again, and I did that, and I ran into Toshiko at uh, one of her shows in the middle of the day, and she was just sitting there, and I told her, hey, I'm playing around with Clay again, and she said, oh, we're finally the camp tomorrow. Bring your stuff down. <laughs> and so I was very intimidated, and I brought my forms down that happened to be like cone six or four clay and they were firing cone ten. I really didn't know what that meant. Uh, fortunately, they survived. Uh, and then Toshiko invited me to come work and that started a 20 odd year relationship. And she said, eventually, you come to work every Sunday like you go to church. <laughs> and uh, for the first seven years, I was waiting to get kicked out, you know, at any time. And then eventually it was uh, family. You know, I really uh, looked at Toshiko as a, a, a mom, you know, and I pretty much did anything that Toshiko suggested because she was always right. <laughs> you know, her intuition, I think, uh, is something that we should talk about and really appreciate is that Toshiko had 
had this extraordinary intuition, and I had the honor of being there with her towards towards the end of her life. You know, with my work, um, I uh, I'll give you a couple of quick examples. I, I was. I uh, got to this point where I was working with coils, I was never really throwing, and I was uh, doing these uh, interesting, what I thought was interesting, more interesting forms, and uh, very, she go very supportive, and one day she came in when I was half the way through a piece, and she looked into the piece and she said, you should make the inside out. And so I, was, I, was, I looked in the piece and it was all curvy, and, Crazy, and that was a, sort of a two-year project of trying to figure out how to make the inside out. And then I, I got to this point where I thought I had mastered coil building. And Toshiko came in one day and said, "No more coils." <laughs> so, so I started working with slabs, and here we are. You know, um, and that first things were, you know, I made this piece and it fell down. And, uh, bunch of them fell down, I really didn't know what I was doing. And, um, and then this evolution, um, I reached a certain point uh, where I was uh, working um, <clears throat> in uh, a formal job uh, and Toshiko suggested that um, I should really think about what did I want in my life. You know, did I want to go make a lot of money, or did I want to follow my passion? And suggested that my work was at a point where maybe it was something I should really focus on. And as I said, I always did what Toshiko said, and I, I quit my job and you know bought a building over here in Gowanus and threw all my money into it, and I'm a full-time sculptor. And uh, the work is. Uh, I'm really fully, fully committed. Um, I've continued to work with slabs, uh, and um, as many artists do that work with the human condition in some of these cases, uh, I think that part of the learning in terms of making the inside out or uh, no more coils is to continue to move forward conceptually. Uh, and with the forms, uh, I feel this urgency about that. And I think that's also going to lead me towards adding some other materials. I mean, Noguchi was uh, uh, a friend of yours and Toshiko's. And I was uh, recently at the Noguchi Museum um, for the Gonzalo Fonseca show. And I, so I'm thinking a lot about this adding elements of other materials uh, to the work. In this case, there's some acrylic, um, but uh, pushing that uh, limit a little bit. So this is a very figurative piece. Uh, it's my essence, and so I think it's pretty liberal where that comes from. Um, uh, this is all my glory, so it's sort of an exuberant, exuberant piece. Um, and I'm, you know, I'm moving towards working a little more with negative space. Uh, with this work and creating a material that um, evolved over the course of the last really five years that allows me to do uh, things that are uh, challenging to do with a pure ceramic uh, material. Um, and uh, uh, that's been exciting. And so we're, we're pretty the studio pretty pretty technical in terms of what we're doing and if the, 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 if the apprentices here all know uh, I was very non-technical at Toshiko's you know so Bill and Don you know they really knew what they were doing with glazes and firing etc and I was making stuff and uh, just uh, having the good fortune to take advantage but once you have your own studio you've got to figure it out and so that's what's been happening in this piece briefly uh, again, trying to push more further out conceptually. Uh, a year ago, uh, well, this was this show was a year ago, happened a year ago, and a year prior to that, and all the stuff that's going on right now, I was thinking of this idea of interdependence. If we're in a space here or you're at home, uh, we really don't think about the fact that. Uh, Within your home, there are probably there are thousands 
of people that touch something around the world in 20 or 30 countries. Uh, so you're subliminally uh, touched by uh, people and cultures from all around the world. And we really don't think about this interdependence and interconnectedness uh, as much as uh, um, one might want to be. Uh, and so I wanted to raise an awareness about that interdependence, but also bring in this element of the real world and the tenuous uh, uh, um, elements of that interdependence that we have in the real world. So these pieces, while this one is fairly figurative, uh, were some of them were very large scale and were very tenuous, particularly in terms of the materialists, whether they would stand or stay together. And you know, we were firing, in this case, only to cone seven, uh, but challenging the material uh, as well. And uh, so, as others have said, you know, I mean, I am, uh, you know, just in my brief discussion here, I, I would say that uh, Toshiko is. No offense to my family, <laughs> but certainly the most influential person uh, in my life, and I, you know, I carry uh, those values in her pictures. And is on the wall of my my studio, so she's always looking down. Um, and I, again, I'll say it's been an honor, you know, Bill Baumbach. Uh, you know, the availability of uh, all, all each of these. Uh, each of the people that are in the show, I probably called up for help at some point. Hey, what about this? What about, you know, I'm trying to think through some idea. And everybody is so generous, uh, uh, you know, in terms of uh, offering. And I think that's sort of something that unifies all of us and was part of, uh, you know, what, uh, uh, who Toshiko was, was that generosity, you know, of spirit. and that uh, uh, impact that she had on so, so many people. So if I can answer any, any questions, I, I, I'm pleased to do that. I know you are not a scientist like everybody, but every apprentice got to know each other, really, because only once she chose for one year. But they became friends among themselves, yeah, I think the uh, the bond is uh, uh, it's family. You know, once you're part of uh, an apprentice at Toshiko's, I mean, with some exception, uh, you're part of the family uh, of people. I was in the uh, unique position as Bill <laughs> of being around for uh, a uh, long line of apprentices. So I got to be there when, when uh, they might be having a challenge, challenging moment with Toshiko to lend in here <laughs> and make sure that uh, maybe their feet were staying on the ground or heads were staying attached to their bodies. So. <laughs> Any other questions? Are the glazes? Yeah. Are the glazes plant-based? Do you know what you Where are you getting the Are you making them? Yeah, I'm making them. I did start with uh, Toshiko's palette uh, initially. And then I uh, am very um, committed to initially working with the form. So I don't really have an idea of what the glaze is going to be. Uh, in terms of plant based now, can't really say that. Water-based, yes. This has acrylic on it, and I had to figure out a way to make the acrylic bond to the piece so it's archival. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, we do massive testing, uh, which I never did before. So for any given show, we might do a thousand test tiles. And then I'll take the test tiles and uh, walk around the room with the, once the body of work is completed, uh, before it goes into bisque, generally, or after bisque, uh, and place tiles, and just keep placing tiles, keep placing tiles, and until I reach that moment where uh, 
uh, I feel that uh, the color or combinations of colors are allowing me to um, create a piece that I feel uh, energized by and is communicating uh, whatever conceptual idea it is that I might be trying to communicate. And I am, again, the Toshiko influences that uh, there is no in-between. It's, you know, it's that moment, capturing that moment. And that's one of the beautiful things, you know, that I learned with Toshiko is, is I think a lot of our struggle is, when, when do you stop? You know, when's the piece done? And something that came and happened at Toshiko's was just, I know when that moment arrives. And it's like, okay, it's done. You know, and I walk, walk away. Or that moment with the patina, you know, of, you know, work markets, you know, it can be a bit of a struggle, but when the moment comes, I know, you know, and I, and I, and I move on to the next. Okay. So, <laughs> okay, next new film is uh, is that. I don't know who's going to talk for Toshiko, but maybe you go along. Right? <laughs> In Leslie. Hello. Can you hear me? Okay. Uh, so yeah, I just wanted to kind of piggyback a little bit off of John. Uh, it, it is an honor to be uh, showing here in, in Williamsburg, at the WA. Uh, I live here in, in Brooklyn now, and it's, it's nice to kind of have a home, home uh, field advantage bit. Um, and it's, it's really an honor to be a part of this show. Uh, every once in a while, we get together as Toshiko's extended family, and it's, it's a great reminder of how special it all is, because most of the year we're out on our own, floating around, and um, and it, it, you know, we're, we're all kind of doing our own thing, and you can kind of see it in the work where everyone's work is very different and unique. And one of the things Toshiko wanted all of us to do is to find our own voice. And um, and it, there's really not a Toshiko look. Uh, often um, I'll hear about a student or a, an apprentice from a long time ago that I hadn't met yet, and see their work, and it's like I would have never guessed. Uh, and I think that's really something special about Toshiko's work. When we put this show together uh, two, year, two years ago in Kansas, there was a show in the same gallery below us um, that was a Ken Ferguson student show. And it was a very interesting uh, juxtaposition of the, the two shows, because Ken's show was very much Ken's students, and you could see Ken in the work, uh, which was great and unique in its own right. Um, but, you know, I, I'm really honored and I feel lucky to have worked with Toshiko because she wanted us all to, to be our, our best selves and to find out what that meant. And there was no way we were gonna do it in the 13 months we were working with her. So she really just put us through boot camp to get us the skills so we could go on and, and grow. Uh, so this work here uh, is, um, it's a good example of how I work. It's, I, I tend to work specific for where I see the work going to, so this was made for this show specifically. Uh, whereas my, uh, my other work, this is Ulysses, my son. Uh, he's the best work. Uh, so uh, my other work tends to be either for the home, so I make it specifically for the home, or it's for a specific exhibition, and so uh, it, it looks like it's made for that, that uh, venue. So this work here was um, a collaboration between myself and Graham Keegan, who spent the summer uh, one year as he was kind of testing the waters to, to see if he wanted to be an apprentice um, a few years after I was with her. And he and I remained close, and um, as we got together, we, wanted, we knew we wanted to work together. We had no idea what that was going to look like. And this show came up, and it was a shared experience. We decided, let's put our heads together and see what we can come up with. And he does natural indigo dyeing and other natural materials out in Los Angeles. So we were... I might have to take a time out here. Yeah, okay. 
So, um, I'll, I'll be back. Let's move on. <laughs> Yuka, would you like to talk about Toshiko's work? <laughs> Almost. Yes, I was very fortunate. I was one of the, uh, I wouldn't say apprentice because I did not learn anything from her directly. I was taking ceramics one time when I was at Pratt Institute, but that was before I met Toshiko. Toshiko and I met in 1979. We had a show together, that's the very beginning. And ever since, she became my aunt, and then she is a mentor, spiritual mentor, that you can feel her presence in this gallery. That's what she has intuition and a strong spiritual presence. She doesn't have to tell you how to make a coil or how to throw the pot. She summarizes, thinks about philosophical things, and then if you receive it, what she means, it means a lot. And some people don't get the idea, of course, because sometimes she says, out of blue, unrelated things, which is almost like Zen monks. But I always enjoy, we always joke about many things too. Now, remarkable thing about Toshiko is she, makes, she made many pots, like ordinary practical pots. I have several of them. And she combined fine art and then practical. Ceramics used to be a very practical use, um, being able to use at your home, plate or vase, things like that. But she broke that barrier by making cross top. So it became sculpturous form. And then at the same time, she applied painterly technique on the surface. So to me, just like our War Center's bridge concept, she bridged between practical ceramic art into sculpture and then painterly technique on her surface. And so she really combined many things, no longer we call it ceramic as we know in a practical sense. So she has she used to say, Yuko, when I opened up this center, she congratulated me. You have a very big duty to do, but I know you can do it. She encouraged me. And then she said, what you can do, she knows my painting very well. Um, most essential thing is to get the most important essence from the East and in the West. If you can apply that, and that will be an international artist, she said. Well, so that, is, that, that was my idea too, by the way. Even though I am from Japan, I highly appreciate Japanese culture, but you as an artist, you have your own ideas to express. And so that's for the beginning of encountering with Toshiko talking about East meets West. She happened to be born in Hawaii by a Japanese ancestor, so she has a certain sensitivities she appreciates and then sensitivities, knowledge of Western art too. But certainly I was very lucky to get to know her in 1979, and then we had several shows together, very honorable. And then after I opened up the law center here, 1996, we, we opened. And then 2001, five years later, we had men, friends and mentors show I organized to thank all my friends and mentors. Toshiko was one of them. I had seven, seven artists show in this space. It was one of the most remarkable shows that I, I have ever curated. The reason why is this, all seven 
prominent artists are more known. Toshiko Takayazu, uh, Isam Haguchi, and then Nansen, uh, you name it, I have a uh, catalog we publish. And then just because it was one month after 9-11, so most of the galleries in New York City were closed. But we kept it open because we had a gala, a dinner gala, 200 people were expecting to come. So we kept it open and then people really appreciated because that is the most tragic time of U.S. history, 9-11s. And then we are looking at some of the big restaurants and what World Trade Center used to be seen from here and from there too. And at that time, one month later, there was a blue light shooting. I wonder if you remember. That's all we saw. But this particular show, mentors and friends show, moved people very much. Excellent show that we had. So some of them started crying. What art can do, art bring people. Without art, life is dull. Life is very colorful, colorless. But art brings people, and then one center brings people. Not only fine art, but performing art, lectures, videos, all creative field, even fashion show we have poetry reading. So all creative activities will take place in this small gem. I call it beautiful building. It's not a matter of sight. This is a this second floor used to be called ceremonial room. And then this building it was built 1867. So it's 150 years old. When I fell in love with this building first um, entered in the first floor, you, you don't get to see the first floor. Used to be a bank, used to be a money bank. I changed into an art bank. So, second floor when I, when I entered here, it was a perfect setting for the fine art. You can see there is no windscot and the wall was all the way down. And then very polite and then very present to have a fine art show. I fell in love with every floor. Upstairs used to be 20 to 16 feet high, 23 feet high ceiling with no pillars. Used to be called High Society's ballroom. So we are using the top floor as a performing art. So when I, when I saw the building for sale, immediately I called and I entered and then I fell in love with of course, I was a struggling, famous word for artists. Struggling, suffering for artists. I was able to manage to put down um, down payment. I had only fifty dollars remaining in my bank. I thought of using up everything, but the banker said, "If you put out entire money, you cannot open." another account because you have to have something remained. So fifty dollars I had remained in my bank. But thank God so many wonderful volunteers started coming in and trying to encourage and then my mentor, seven of them, behind me, supported me. So it's not only one person's effort and people if you throw good energy, eventually energy comes back, that I started running a lot. And so look at what we have today. Wonderful connection that I made. And then Boras, where is Jeff? Jeff was the one, about one, one year ago, we had SUNY, Newport show, MFA series show we have here, last April. And he approached me by saying that I like to propose a special show. So I said, I don't know what this is. But he mentioned something about Toshiko Takaya's apprentice show. So I jumped with joy and looking forward for the 
time to come, and finally, a year later, what we have is a tremendous, beautiful show. So Toshiko made a bridge, and then I made a bridge with everybody, and then I am very, very happy to have this special show, to me, very significant, to you also. So I thank you very, very much for making the bridge. That is the War Center's mission statement. Bridge between you and me, all the young, men and women, between fine art, performing art, all creative fields, and then bridge between local, national, international. We happen to be right next to the Williamsburg Bridge, so it's appropriate to make a bridge. Unless we make a bridge, we are isolated. And unless we start talking, we don't know what they are thinking. So, find out art. They talk to you too, even though not verbally, but visually audible. And that is a human communication. And then it is a wonderful thing to have created people here and then appreciating here very much. I hate to see the show go out of my sight, but this will not be the last time. I hope I, hope I will get to see you again. Thank you very much. It is, uh, it's a pretty overwhelming honor to be here and, and sharing with this group and uh, to be, uh, yeah, to be, to be showing with Toshiko's uh, work is, is something that is, uh, uh, that I don't take, take lightly and uh, is, is pretty overwhelming. When, un unlike uh, Jeff getting to introduce to Toshiko's work um, at the Tang, uh, for me, I was a student at Lewis and Clark and it was spring of my freshman year and she came to do a workshop uh, and so she arrived on Wednesday and was in the studio and uh, I just sat there for the three days, Wednesday, Thursday and Friday while she was making her work and uh, just sat and chatted and observed and it was, uh, it was she was this palpable force uh, calming and, and yet unbelievably powerful and uh, so she we talked about what I could do in the summer and she sent me to Skidmore to summer six and uh, and then it turned out that uh, Ken Shores was retiring from from Skidmore and so I was gonna uh, try to try to transfer to Skid Ken Shores was retiring from Lewis and Clark and I was going to transfer to Skidmore. And I was pretty nervous about it, because at, at summer six, it seemed like it was this really big program, and I just wasn't sure I was ready for that. And so in my, in my unbelievable naivete, I said, well, Toshiko, I'm worried about if I can hack it at Skidmore. Do you think I could come and be your apprentice for a year? And uh, she was so diplomatic and so <laughs> kind. She said, I wouldn't want to be responsible for you not finishing college. So I want you to finish college and then when you're done, then you can come and work with me. And uh, so in my mind, that's what was going to happen. And I was relieved and I, she encouraged me that I would be fine at Skidmore. And, uh, and then my senior year, fall of my senior year, she, she was there making a big piece. And she said, so what are you going to do next year? And I was a little bit crestfallen, and, and, and I said, well, I was hoping I was going to come and work with you. She said, oh, good, that's what I was thinking. I just wanted to make sure you were still, still committed. So, uh, and in thinking back about that first project that, uh, that I was doing there was uh, the Siberian irises uh, had been overtaken with the crabgrass. So I was digging them up and pulling out the crabgrass because if there's just a tiny bit of crabgrass, it will all grow back. And, uh, I think my lesson from that is uh, the value in doing a good job. Uh, you don't want to do a Capullo job. Uh, so that was, that was my life lesson. And, uh, 
that's something that I, I think that I, I carry forward. Uh, for better or for worse, in terms of how long it takes me to get these different things done, I always try and do my absolute best. Uh, and, and so that was that was what was carried forth, and I, and I think continues. And obviously, the value of of, uh, of caring for the preparation and uh, and the celebration around food uh, was something that was uh, you that experience of being at Toshiko's and having that as being such a pivotal part of whenever visitors would come, uh, as well as just the, the meals that she and I would share. Uh, this, this work uh, is very much uh, sort of the antithesis of that. Uh, th this work is uh, sort of about the, the prickliness of life and the, the portal that, that we all uh, travel through and, and, how, and how we navigate uh, that and, and hopefully uh, we find our path through uh, those, those challenging uh, challenges that present themselves. And, and I, th I think that I'd like to leave it at that. Uh, so uh, each person can kind of take that with, with what they will and, uh, and see where they, where they go with it. I do, I do throw pots, although, uh, as Mike mentioned, uh, it is uh, the, the, the skill of some of uh, the other apprentices in terms of thrown pots is far better than mine. So whenever I do bring my thrown pieces down there, it, it's not a feel-good experience for me. Uh, <laughs> the comparison there is uh, uh, others do it much better than I do. So I enjoy it a great deal. I got a question, Cindy. Yeah. So you've been in ceramic arts education, is it almost 20 years? It's not quite. That yeah, long. since 99, so almost 20 years. Yeah, and I've been an educator for like at least 15. Yeah. Say. Yeah. Um, how much of you find yourself sourcing stuff from, like, or how much do you, do you sometimes catch, like, Toshiko's voice coming out to your, from you, through you, to your students? Is that, do you ever catch that, or is that something you try to harness and then bring your own brains? I think that it is so infused in me through my experience of being there for that year and for having gone and visited and, and, and come back that it, I think that I'm, it's just part of the way I am and so I don't know that I, I, don't know that I piece it out uh, in that way, although I, I, I like the question and I'll think a little bit more about right. that. Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions? Great. So I would also like to uh, to thank uh, Jeff, Leslie, and Yuka of the Watt Center for putting this show together. It's been uh, similar to our previous uh, Apprentice Mentor show, which took place in Kansas City a couple of years ago. Uh, it's just a great honor to be um, exhibiting in the same room as all of these uh, former Toshiko uh, apprentices and students who I think really show uh, such a great variety, not only of styles and types and abilities, but the fact that literally uh, most of the people exhibiting here are, are professional artists. Uh, I would say <clears throat> I'm one of the one or two who isn't a professional artist. I started as an apprentice <clears throat> back in 78 around the time when we first built the kiln in Quakertown. And uh, it's really over the last, <clears throat> I guess it's 40 years now, uh, I've been working at the studio, helping out uh, over the years, um, getting to know some of the people, uh, some of the people in this room who were apprentices at the time. 
And uh, that group, along with Toshiko, is really the sum total of, of my influences. I think I've, uh, not having been uh, totally in the art world during that period, that's where I learned everything, was from these, these guys, these people. Um, living with Toshiko uh, as an apprentice and off and on during the years after, uh, being around a great artist is daunting, incredible. Uh, I think learning and sort of observing her philosophy, her connections with the natural world, the way she dealt with people, um, very similar to what everyone else has, has experienced. Um, in addition to which, uh, she was an artist in just about every way, including cooking. And to be able to, to be around there, uh, literally having a work of art prepared for you at every meal was uh, pretty amazing. Uh, <clears throat> I would say my work has, uh, to a large extent, remained somewhat similar over the, these past 40 years, in part because I haven't been working as a professional. Uh, the glazes are literally the same glazes, for the most part, that we used back in the 70s in the studio, um, which are still being used in Toshiko's studio. I think uh, some of the, at least the sculptural pieces I've been working on are largely uh, in some ways determined by the, the scale of the kiln we have, the, the types of clay we use, the glazes that are available. Um, this issue of functional versus sculptural work I think has always been a big part of the Toshiko experience since she obviously did both. Um, I think all of us felt the urge to to make structural things, and I guess literally, uh, there aren't that many functional pieces in this show. Uh, a couple of bowls of mine. Um, these seats and tables are actually, uh, I guess, my own way of trying to combine functional and sculptural uh, uh, work. And in fact, this is uh, this type of clay furniture is something I've been doing for the last, I don't know, maybe five years or so. Um, and uh, it's really been a lot of fun. Uh, and I love being able to uh, make things that people can literally, you know, just have around the house and it's a piece of furniture. Um, on the other hand, this sort of sculptural thing is, uh, I think, uh, in some ways even more uh, exciting to work with. In large part, uh, the idea of creating something that lends a sense of movement, um, which I think Toshiko's work did to an incredible extent, um, coupled with the actual movement that takes place with clay when it's being fired in the kiln. For instance, this piece literally bent probably like four inches uh, you know, leaned up against the wall of the kiln when it was being fired. So that sort of thing is just, uh, at least to me, the uh, one of the biggest excitements of working in clay, especially the style that we did and still do at, at Toshiko's studio. Uh, the very high fire, the ash glazes, sort of the natural um, I'd say uh, the sense that a lot of what we do is coming from a natural uh, sort of environment, in, in some ways based on really Toshiko's philosophy of life. But, um, so in that regard, I, it was just a big honor to be able to, to work there off and on for those 40 years, and now to be part of uh, the Takeizu Foundation, which we're trying to, uh, especially with Don Fletcher's uh, leadership, trying to create something permanent that will bring Toshiko's 
uh, way of, of work and life and her physical studio and a lot of her work that still remains there as a perpetual educational foundation. So we'll see how that goes. Uh, are there any questions? Hey folks, my name is Ben. Uh, my piece is in the corner there, and uh, I'd just like to, I can stand by it. Can I reach? There. I think it's easier if I'm in the middle of the. Uh, and I'll try to be really quick. I know this has been a great, great to hear stories, and um, it's kind of just people share their experiences. They all have it to Chico, because they're all really unique. And um, yeah, my experience was pretty similar. Um, we'd like to do a quick shout out to Jeff. Uh, I coordinated the, the first genesis of the show uh, with Andy Ray in Kansas City, and it was a lot nicer being just a participant than an organizer this time, <laughs> so uh, someone else gets to do it next time. Um, a story I've been throwing around in my head, and you know, we all have so many of these crazy stories from our 13 months with Chico. I was there about 15 years ago after finishing uh, studying ceramics with Leslie Skidmore. And um, I got to know the apprenticeship through Nick, a really good buddy, and um, it was really intimidating at that point in time um, because there had been a series we call the, the OG, uh, Tim, Darren, and Andy, were sort of the coveted trio, the trilogy of uh, the best of the best. So there was a really high bar, and um, it was just, and Toshiko itself was extremely intimidating, very high standards, and you just knew you had to be on all the time. Um, and it was really couldn't compare yourself to who was there before, it's just you had to bring something really good. And so um, Nick was there, I was like, oh man, I don't know if I can do this. Um, I, I'm just gonna, I think, I think this will work, but um, to be really transparent, I, I was probably considering doing the apprenticeship for, um, I've never told the story, but uh, for probably really selfish reasons. Um, I got into clay very, very early, early on in my life, I was about 13, and by about 17, 18, I, I knew this is what I was going to do, and finishing college, like, what better way to kind of build a, a career than go work for one of the most important 20th century clay artists? So I was like thinking of it as a stepping stone. Totally the wrong reason to do the apprenticeship. <laughs> and, um, you know, so I thought a lot about it, and I, I taught um, uh, high school ceramics for a number of years, and um, I've been able to, to process my whole experience and her effect on me as an artist and as a person um, a lot. But what I've really kind of come to is that, um, and I think we all realize this at some point throughout our year with her, um, the more you focus on her and the more you focus on her work and her life and all the things that she needed, um, the more you learn about yourself. And that, that was the biggest thing. She never had to tell you that. You just, you just picked it up um, and you absorbed it. And we all were able to translate that artistically, personally, holistically, in a lot of different ways. Um, so on my end, uh, her biggest contribution to, to me as an artist, um, that I know Nick really, I think, spoke about it really well when we had the group show in Kansas City, with the Ken Ferguson project, or the Ken Ferguson student show beneath us, and um, actually at the Nsika show in 2015 in Providence, there was the, um, the, apprentice, the new apprentice project that my friend Mark Shapiro has put together, and it's about apprenticeship lineage, um, primarily with functional clay artists. Um, and I've been able to talk to Mark. Mark's in his mid-60s, and he's, he's had about seven or eight apprentices, and I've been able to talk about this theory of apprenticeship currently, because when you think of doing maybe a career or going to art school, either state school, private school, versus and all the, the debt and all this, this financial burden and what you may or may not learn, an apprenticeship is actually, certainly at this point in time, a pretty amazing alternative uh, financially and I think artistically. And um, I've been able to think a lot about that. But looking at that show, you could see in, at Nsika and the Ken Ferguson show, you could see that the uh, artists who had apprentice, apprenticeship programs produced artists and work that looked a lot like theirs. It was just not what Toshiko's apprenticeship was about. Um, it was about the individual. She knew what her strengths were coming in, um, whether that was through Leslie um, or other friends. Tim, can you remember your, your professor at Lucy Clark? I can't remember. Ken Shores. Ken Shores. Um, she just sort of had these like 
soldiers in the field that just like knew of good people that might work well with her because um, she had really unique standards. So she would know your strengths um, and she knew I was a really, really strong potter and the wheel came very naturally to me so she kicked me off the wheel very quickly and had me hand built and you know I was 20, uh, 22 to 23 years old and she had me do these really weird slab pieces that I didn't even really think about. In fact, I, I probably hated them, like, passionately. I hated doing it. I hated that she made me do the work. Um, it was mandatory. And yet, it, those pieces went on to become uh, the foundation for my MFA thesis show um, about four years later. Never knew that was going to happen. Ever. She probably did. That, that's the crazy part. Um, so, um, I think we all, as apprentices, had probably have a story like that where there was something that happened just out of pure, pure happenstance, um, where there was an intended objective that she probably had this little kernel back in her head um, that we had no idea. We were young, you know, right out of college, we, we knew nothing, she knew everything. And as, you know, as John really said, she tells you to jump, you just, how high? Like, you just, you just do it. Um, so, yeah, and I've, I've told that story a bunch. Um, and reflecting on it now and seeing the work and hearing everybody talk about their experiences really kind of hammers home um, how incredible the apprenticeship was. And, and I really can't emphasize it enough. It's, it's extremely unique. And there are only a handful of apprenticeships in the States um, like it. Um, uh, in fact, it, it might have been really one of a kind. So i um, really excited to be part of this. Uh, I feel totally not worthy of being last, but I guess that's where we'll leave it. Um, it Folks have questions. My work, it's, I can talk about pottery or sculpture, but if you want to talk about questions about the apprenticeship or anything else, but um, you guys have been listening for two hours now, so I'm sure we'll wrap it up. But thank you. I have a question again. Can you move around your piece? And um, you know, I'd like to see how this piece looks angularly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the back you can see uh, right here where we, <coughs> where we touch the wall of the kiln. So yeah, I'm really uh, thankful that it still stands. <laughs> <laughs> Very interesting. Wonderful. And the other one is too, but always as a sculpture, I like to see behind, going sideways. Yeah. Yeah. This uh, the is basically this high. Mm -hmm. So, just, you know, everything shrinks when it's fired. So, mm -hmm. it's, it's pretty but much the same. The scale is a kill. Yeah, maybe you can explain to me. So briefly, how you made this piece? Um, well, <clears throat> all of these, at least the top sculptures uh, I made were, um, <clears throat> again, a directive from Toshiko. She's like, make slab work. So I tried to make slab work, and I would say the first half a dozen essentially fell apart. And as I slowly figured out how to do it, um, they're, they're, they're all made from the ground up and dried slowly as you go so they can support themselves. Um, and they take about, I would say, three weeks to a month to make in that regard. Um, these, these sort of uh, foil based, uh, and I've also made some slab based uh, furniture type pieces. Are similar. Uh, they take a week or two to make, and a long time to dry. I think that's. I mean, Toshiko was really a master at that sort of thing. The moon pots she was making, I think, are really unique. Uh, the molds that uh, I think Barbara Tussaud made years ago were essentially some of the biggest uh, sculptural pieces that anyone had ever seen, and that sort of uh, motif of a comb ten stoneware firing. Um, so it was, uh, it was really unique 
chance to, to see that sort of work being made and to be part of that. Stuff got stuff. Like, 